I'm going to talk about uh, treatment, open and endovascular treatment of the, the conditions Dr. Sheehan just went through. So a um, little outline of what we'll talk about, a few of the indications. We'll talk about endovascular techniques, open techniques, and then I'll show you a little bit of comparative data about open versus endo treatment of visceral, uh, visceral occlusive disease. So um, mesenteric arterial ischemia has a whole laundry list of causes, of course, but 95% of it's athero. And uh, just as Dr. Sheehan uh, pointed out, I think the uh, chronic mesenteric ischemia as a diagnosis is ex exceedingly rare, uh, but visceral atherosclerosis is exceedingly common. So you, you definitely can't be a lesionologist in this uh, territory or you're uh, going to get in trouble. You have to make sure that the anatomy uh, and the, and the uh, clinical picture uh, add up and that you're treating truly symptomatic chronic mesenteric ischemia. On the other hand, it's a diagnosis you can't miss. So, you know, this is all about clinical diagnosis. If you make the diagnosis of chronic mesenteric ischemia, revascularization is mandatory. There's really no role for watching this, optimizing this, hoping they gain a little weight. That will not work. That will result ultimately in death. Uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you know, there was a little bit of a uh, you know, the people always think, well, what about TPN? You know, can't they gain weight, manage it conservatively if they're real high operative risk? Unfortunately, you know, in the limited data that's out there, that, that doesn't work. I mean, ultimately, people need to have their nutrition via their intestines, for, uh, as, you, as you know, you know, maybe from some of your general surgery training. But there's a lot of unsettled issues here in, uh, in this field. So how many vessels to treat and what's the best treatment, endo versus open? I'll go through a little bit of that. So first endo treatments actually as far back as 1980, uh, which when, you know, when like most endo treatment at that time was so-called POBA, which is, I find to be a very annoying acronym, but just a plain old balloon angioplasty. But angioplasty started in the 80s for mesenteric disease. But I think it, it's very clear that primary stenting with a balloon expandable stent, bare metal for the most part, in some cases covered stents, uh, has sort of become the, you know, really the, the the mainstay of treatment. Uh, the reason for a balloon expandable stent is that this is mostly orificial disease. So this is aortic spillover disease. This is aortic plaque that's gotten to the origin of the vessels. So in general, not always, but in general you need the, you need the superior radial force and the precision of a balloon expandable stent. And the approach, if it's going to be percutaneous, can be either anagrade, as it is in probably 98, 99% of cases, or in some rare instances, uh, open retrograde. Just a little snapshot of sort of how this field's evolved. I mean, look at this from, this is, uh, this isn't even all that current really, up to 2009. So you see in the 90s, I mean, all 90% of this treatment was open and now 90% is endo. But there's still a lot of role for, there's still a lot, you're going to encounter some difficult lesions. So really you have to have, be facile with, with both approaches. In general, the technique uh, of a um, endovascular revascularization, um, you know, first depends on a good diagnosis. Almost always an AP, you know, aortogram and a lateral is really going to show you the origins of the vessels. I think you'll find that one little tip is to have, you know, if you're, if you're going to go to a lateral and you have some, a patient of any size at all, their arms above their head to help image is exceedingly helpful when you're setting up either your cath lab or, or your hybrid suite. And then the angle of a, the, the re, uh, brachial versus femoral approach really determines on the, deter, uh, depends on the angle of the celiac or the SMA. In my mind, 80% of them are better, to, more easily done from the brachial. But if you have a celiac or an SMA that does not have a very acute angle, but is sort of about 90 degrees or maybe just a little more than that, you can usually get that from a femoral approach like this case. If you have a downsloping <coughs> vessel at all, your angle is much better coming from above down the brachial. Um, I think what many people prefer is a so-called no-touch technique. I mean, really, you make the diagnosis, you've had the diagnosis based on the CTA, confirm it with your lateral arteriogram. So a lot of selection of the vessel before deciding to treat is usually not necessary. So in many cases, you can have a, a guide cath just, you know, parked through a sheath at the origin of the vessel. Uh, usually a lima from below, maybe an MP catheter from above, an MP guide. Something called an MP2 guide is a really nice shape for, a, for an SMA. 
and then an 01, you know, 014 wire. Puff through your guide cath, confirm the diagnosis, and then go right to treatment through that. Have your treatment platform set up. 014 wire, maybe a predilation if you have a really tight lesion. Stent deployment through your guide cath. So usually that means you're, you're generally going to need a six French guide cath. Uh, and then a confirmatory aortogram. So really this, you know, if you set yourself up right, there, there's usually not a lot of futzing around. Uh, if you have a good CTA to start, you set, your, you set yourself up right for the, for the intervention. Um, here's one, here's that, uh, you know, uh, one where you kind of have a down sloping angle and so you can see that catheter on the right sided picture there. You can see that catheter swooping from above and it just often, it's, it gives you often a very good angle just to get, get right into the vessel and it, it you know, it really the selection is, is generally not very hard. So what's favorable for endo? So I mean really what you have to iron out for yourself is what can you get done endo and what's going to have some reasonable durability. So endo favorable lesions are short lesions. Minimal to moderate calcification. I'll show you some pictures of a, of a sort of a very severe orificial disease process that is not amenable to endo. So if you have a lot of huge bulky calcium, I don't care what kind of stent you're going to use. That's going to be you know, a risky procedure and probably have, you know, not a very durable result. Um, so chronic total occlusions can be done endo, but I'd say in general you have to have a little lead point in the lesion. You can't just have a flush with the aorta. You could be poking around all day and you really have no idea where it is. Uh, so the opposite of all those things are sort of unfavorable for endo. And, you know, the, uh, the results, you know, like many things in the, in the endo field, here's a whole series. Here's the four biggest series for endo treatment. Pretty good series, actually. I mean, 80 to 260 patients, not bad. But even the biggest series from these, a lot of centers of excellence, I mean, really, the patency data on this is very short term, mostly one and two year data. And you can see it's like a lot of endo. 60 to 80 <laughs> percent and, and so that you know that's sort of what you have to realize is sort of uh, you know your expected durability on the other hand these are sick patients uh many of them so um the decision making the decision to go endo for something that's technically technically feasible i personally think it is is the right choice and will be in most cases um if you look here at uh people so i mentioned Occluded vessels. Uh, can you get occluded vessels done? Uh, endo? The answer is yes. And this study out of Cleveland Clinic showed that their outcomes in occluded visceral arteries were equivalent to their outcomes in uh, just stenotic arteries. So, you know, if with you, you can you can get it done. Although I'm sure there's a there is definitely some selection bias. I'm sure sure in this report. But basically, what this shows is what you might expect. Primary patency rate sort of at one year in the 65%. But if you follow things closely with duplex, you re-intervene, you, re you replast the instant stenosis of the stench you place, you can get good, very good you know, assisted and secondary patency. Um, move on a little bit. So what about instant stenosis, just sort of as an aside? Uh, most of the time, you can treat this endo again if it's true in stent stenosis. I mean, as long as it hasn't occluded at the origin, it can often be treated safely with endo, whether it's in the stent itself or often you'll have either progressive disease or intimal hyperplasia at the distal end of the stent. Most, usually, you have secondary endo options to treat that. Covered stents, people always think about covered stents, and the data for covered stents for endo revascularization of visceral vessels is relatively limited actually. Uh, you know, I think many people probably approach this as they do covered stents for the iliac arteries. So I would think about it if you have something that looks highly embologenic, uh, a vessel that looks highly calcified but also fragile, so you think maybe there's an above average rupture risk, that's an area, that's when you might think about a, a short, bare, a short uh, balloon expandable covered stent. You have to realize anytime you're going to go covered stenting, your access requirements go up by a French or two for the most part. So um, it's something you, you have to have, uh, you know, a lot of these are little old ladies, you know, who have been smoking all their lives. You know, you have to think about the size of the brachial artery before you, to, you know, when you're, when you're uh, planning your, uh, w what stent you want to use. Here's an example of something you see, okay, uh, that, you know, when you see this, these are the cases where you have to be able to do open surgery. So you have an aortogram and you basically have flush occlusions without any lead points. 
I guess I'd make a couple, you know, so this is going to be, this is why you need to do, be able to do open surgery for this. This does not have good endo options. When you do for your imaging for this, you need to really make sure you get the imaging you need to set up your operation. So this can be, you know, you see here on this very delayed view, reconstitution of the SMA. Uh, you won't always be able to tell this based on the CTA. You'll see where the, level, the vessel's calcified and maybe occluded, but you really, you need good imaging to plan where your, your, your distal bypass target. Um, all right, so what are some of the open options? So we've talked about endo. Now we'll go to sort of open options for mesenteric ischemia. They sort of fall into, I guess, you know, maybe three categories plus median arcuate ligament syndrome operation. So for acute mesenteric ischemia, we'll just briefly cover embolectomy. For, uh, in, for chronic, there's really kind of two options. One is mesenteric bypass. You know, option A is antegrade, option B is retrograde. And then this entity called transaortic splanchnic endarterectomy, and I'll show you a little bit about that. So um, really the sort of gold standard and what probably has the best outcomes and the best shown outcomes is uh, anagrade aorto, celiac, and SMA bypass. Um, you know, this, this is the supraceliac aorta at the diaphragmatic hiatus and just above. You really put these grafts in the low thoracic aorta is really where you end up putting them. That tends to be spared of disease, so it allows you to clamp and, and have a nice inflow landing zone. In general, if you can take it to both vessels, you should. That's how most people believe. If you can revascularize two, then most people believe that that's, that's the, it does not cost you a lot of extra work in general uh, because the celiac bypass, you know, is readily done. It's right, right there uh, in, your pro, in your proximal exposure. And, and in general, the patency outcomes are thought to be a little bit better. Uh, Dr. Sheehan showed you this uh, part of the mobilization here. Now, retrograde bypass. So when do you do that? Well, you do that if either you, mostly based on the patient physiology and frailty. If you think that they cannot tolerate a supravisceral clamp, well, then you need to start about, think about a less stressful option. In general, that's not going to be the distal aorta. That tends to have athero. It's generally going to be a common iliac artery that happens to be spared. So somewhere you can clamp it. It really doesn't matter which one. Uh, the bypass, you can imagine that the bypass from the right iliac maybe tends to be a little bit longer, so maybe you get a little gentler C curve in this bypass. You can imagine if you shorten this bypass up to the distal inferenal aorta, it just is a, it's too much of a C. There's too much, um, there's too much kink and the potential for kink in the bypass. Um, so many patients, frail patients, especially if you're sort of maybe, you know, getting them out of trouble in an acute and chronic situation, this is a very good, this is a very good uh, option. Uh, here's an example. Um, uh, you know, really, this, this exposure of the SMA, uh, I think people get confused on. This is not a transperitoneal exposure of the SMA at the root of the mesentery. There's no way to get a bypass from the iliac artery there. This is really a lateral exposure of the SMA in those few centimeters that Dr. Sheehan referred to. So you're really rolling up the duodenum to the left. You're really getting on the left, very posterolateral lateral side of the SMA. Um, getting about three to five centimeters out the SMA is usually, usually your landing zone for this bypass. So a whole different syndrome that you, you will see uh, occasionally is something called coral uh, reef syndrome. So if you see this pattern of athero where you have bulky plaque on the anterior aortic wall obstructing the celiac and the SMA, sometimes extending down into the renals, you cannot treat that endo <laughs> uh, well. Uh, that, that's sort of where this option of a transaortic splanchnic endarterectomy comes in. So in general, that can be done a, f a few ways. That can either be done through a midline. Actually, a very good incision for that, this procedure is actually a transverse abdominal, depending on the habitus. So if you have, uh, and then many people will do a complete medial visceral rotation here. So this is behind the spleen, behind the kidney, everything coming up to the left. Uh, that really probably gives you the best exposure, I mean, coming up to the right, from left to right, rolling it up, gives you the best exposure of the paravisceral aorta here, and, and ultimately ends up looking something like that. Uh, and um, what you do is this operation. So, you know, you usually, again, just above the plaque is spared, and it's actually, you know, as long as you have good control of the vessels and know this technique, it's less, 
it's less work to do this than to do bypasses, basically, if you have a limited amount of plaque that you can endorectomize. Um, and so some, you know, many people kind of describe a trapdoor incision here. Uh, so I'm running over a little bit. Um, I'm going to, here's the bottom line for open versus endo. There's no, there's no level one data. Everything out there is series with obvious selection bias. You can imagine this is a very, this is impossible really to randomize people to treatments and, and to really have good, well-controlled treatments based on anatomy. Um, acute mesenteric ischemia is embolectomy at the base of the mesentery. Um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, treatment of median arcuate ligament syndrome. As you get into practice, this you kind of have to decide uh, how you're going to handle this. I mean, there's there's open and laparoscopic release. I think people. I think you're justified in going either way. I really do. Unless you happen to be maintain your laparoscopic skills that you have, if you're going to do laparoscopic release, you're going to end up referring it to somebody. So your, your job is going to be the diagnosis and the imaging, and, and they're going to do the release. And, and, and if you have a talented lapros laparoscopic surgeon, they can get a very good release of median arcuate. Um, open revascularization has some, has some advantages. It, you know, it, it, um, it has the advantages. If you, if you do it, you get comfortable with the exposure, and it, it helps you yeah, do celiac revascularization if you need to. Um, so overall, really what you need to do here for open versus endo for this is you have to tailor the therapy to the in, in, individual, uh, but we still have a lot of unsettled issues. For example, does endo burn bridges for open? You have to think about that. You don't, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna go crazy endo and, and burn any open uh, options that you might have for the patient. Thank you very much.